Take a look at this. This Chinese spacecraft looks similar to SpaceX's Crew Dragon, but as you draw closer, the number of windows are different, as are the layout of seats, and this version doesn't have a service module. This blue spacecraft is called Rocketaholic from the Chinese startup Deep Blue Aerospace. So who are these guys? Deep Blue Aerospace was founded in 2016. They're a company that's been working on reusable vertical takeout vertical landing rockets for the past eight years. Their main rocket so far is called the Nebula One. It's a small two-stage rocket with Kerlox fueled engines capable of sending two tons to low Earth orbits. Deep Blue Aerospace is probably the most advanced Chinese company in terms of VTVL technology. They began with low altitude hops with a small prototype around 2021 and 2022, and they recently started performing larger scale tests with the Nebula One first stage with hopes of reaching 100 kilometer hops by the end of 2024. Now, I have a whole other video discussing China's progress with reusable rockets, so check that out if you're interested. But back to this mysterious Chinese blue capsule. Just a few weeks ago, on October the 23rd, 2024, the company Deep Blue Aerospace made a statement announcing that it was venturing into suborbital space tourism. And in comes Rocketholic. This spacecraft has a diameter of 3.5 meters, a total height of 4 meters, and a total liftoff weight of 7.9 tons. It has a total payload capacity of 1,200 kilograms and can host up to six people. The Rocketaholic spacecraft will launch on top of a Nebula 1 first stage for a total flight time of 12 minutes. After separation with the Rocketaholic crewed capsule, the Nebula 1 booster will return to the launch site and perform a vertical landing, while the passengers will experience microgravity during roughly five minutes, following which the capsule will return to the ground, slowing down with the help of parachutes. Passengers will pass the Karman line, meaning the altitude of 100 kilometers, to be officially in space. And this is a noteworthy point because this was previously a marketing point of contention between Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. Now, does getting into suborbital space tourism make sense for Deep Blue Aerospace? Deep Blue Aerospace is not the first Chinese company to announce such a project. For example, Caspace announced back in August 2021 the development of a similar project, with the entry into service targeted around 2027 or 2028. More recently, the startup Asspace showed a render of a suborbital capsule of their own, stating that they plan to achieve suborbital space tourism within the next three to five years. But back to Deep Blue Aerospace, this is a company that nearly has an off-the-shelf rocket, the Nebula One, to launch their Rocketaholic capsule. So in a sense, Rocketaholic seems like a way to generate additional revenue with the Nebula One and to make the economics of such a small rocket work. Let me explain. The Nebula One is small. It can put up to two tons to low Earth orbits, a capacity that is generally considered too low to capture the high volume mega constellation deployment market. Therefore, investing in reusable rocket technologies for such a small rocket doesn't really make economic sense. And it's not a coincidence if all the other reusable rockets that Chinese competitors are developing are much larger. However, by using the Nebula One as the launch vehicle for suborbital space tourism, Deep Blue Aerospace would open up the rocket to a whole new market and give the Nebula One rocket more purpose. A challenge that Deep Blue Aerospace will face, though, is that they are purely a rocket company with no experience in building spacecraft. So succeeding with this new venture would mean significant R&D efforts, which makes me question their objective of conducting the first crew flight in 2027. In stark contrast, Deep Blue Aerospace's competitor, Aspace, is a company with a background in designing spacecraft for microgravity experiments and cargo transportation. Building spacecraft is their core expertise. Therefore, suborbital space tourism seems like a more natural step for them compared to Deep Blue Aerospace. But they don't have a rocket for this capsule, and so they will likely have to reach out to launch service providers like iSpace's Hyperbola 2 first stage or even Deep Blue Aerospace's Nebula 1. The third competitor, Caspace, finds itself in yet another entirely different situation. 
while they are a launch company like Deep Blue Aerospace, they don't have an existing rocket off the shelf that would suit the requirements of a suborbital space capsule, so they are developing one from scratch. They also don't necessarily have experience with crewed spacecraft design, but Caspace is closely tied to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which includes the satellite manufacturer Shanghai Microsat in their ecosystem, and these guys are designing a cargo spacecraft called Qingzhou, which I'll talk about in the next Dongfang Air episode. And so, due to Caspace's close links with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, I'm fairly confident with their ability to either find the necessary funding for their space tourism ventures, and also to find experienced talent for this kind of spacecraft. Now, the million dollar question is, is there a business case for suborbital space tourism for these companies? Deep Blue Aerospace announced that they would sell the first tickets at the price of 1.5 million RMB per person, which is roughly 200,000 US dollars. This is significantly cheaper than the most recent ticket prices from Virgin Galactic, and also from what I understand from Blue Origin. So Deep Blue Aerospace and the other Chinese companies may have a competitive advantage here, especially since suborbital space tourism is, in my opinion, a less sensitive activity. What I mean is, you're basically selling an experience to an individual, as opposed to, say, selling highly sensitive rocket parts to a company. Therefore, Chinese space tourism service providers are less likely to be impacted by any US restrictions. Now, having said that, space tourism is a service for the ultra rich, which means that the price advantage that Chinese companies have may not be the main differentiator. Reliability, safety, and reputation are likely far more important. And finally, if we look at the potential of China's domestic markets, I'm feeling a bit bearish because there are a lot of wealthy Chinese people in China today. And a recent piece by CNBC estimated, for example, that there were over 2,300 individuals with a net worth of at least 100 million US dollars in China. And these are, in my opinion, the people who are the target market for space tourism. But China's economy is not at its best at the moment, and the Chinese government has been promoting this political ideal of quote-unquote common prosperity, discouraging any ostentatious displays of wealth. And so while there is and there will always be a large market for luxury goods and experiences in China, in my opinion, suborbital space tourism could be too visible a display of wealth for the wealthy. Anyway, that's my personal opinion, but I'd love to hear what you think. Do you believe that there is a business case for Chinese suborbital space tourism companies in China or outside of China? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I want to say a special thank you to my patrons on patreon.com and YouTube memberships. Your support helps the channel a great deal, including helping me get motion graphics designers to make the cool animations that you see in these videos. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.